unknown aircraft. I request you identify yourself. Well, continuing to close. If you do not turn away, I may be forced to take action against you in self-defense. Engage! This is HMS Daring, the first new destroyer built in Britain since 1985. Dominated by its radar mounted high above the deck, Daring is one of six new destroyers that's a quantum leap forward in naval technology. As an island nation, Britain emerged as a world power by taming and controlling the seas. Britain's role in the world is diminished, but the Royal Navy still feels it can influence the four corners of the globe. With old and outmoded ships standing guard over our shores, the Navy needs defence for the 21st century, with a ship that's new with technology that's never been to sea. How will this ancient institution adjust to the modern world? Since 2004, we've had special access to watch and analyze the whole process as the Royal Navy overturns tradition to embrace the computer generation. We'll watch the shipbuilders come to terms with building a modern warship, new skills alongside traditional jobs. We'll see the dramatic launch of Daring, a royal occasion for the people of Glasgow to match the historic launch days of old on the Clyde. The Royal Navy has built this ship around its radar and weapons. We'll see firsthand how these new systems came about and work. And we'll be with Daring's crew of men and women as they test their ship to the limit. missiles before they see us. We'll watch as the captain leads his crew into action stations, the reality of life in the Navy and war. It's the closest thing to real battle. Our story and Daring's life starts in March 2003. From the beginning, it's been engineering on a grand scale, revolutionizing the traditional industry of shipbuilding. Over 10,000 contractors have been involved. It's the ultimate in mega Lego construction. The modern shipyard is an assembly line. Where once whole ships were hot riveted and hammered, this new generation of warship is made the modern way in sections and quickly. The Navy's schedule says daring must be completed in less than five and a half years. The work has been carved up between three locations in the south of England and Scotland. Jobs are spread around the country and the schedule constantly monitored.
the sections will be joined into one long hull. Here, at the Scotston Yard on the River Clyde, the spiritual home of shipbuilding, a fitting birthplace for daring. As the sections are completed around the country, the construction team wait anxiously to see if their calculations are correct and the pieces slot together, as promised to the Navy. The finished hull will be 152 metres long and just over 21 metres wide. Daring will be the biggest ship launched from the Scotston Yard. HMS Daring is the Royal Navy's most costly and complex ship to date. It's designed with the computer generation in mind. Daring is built in six sections in three different locations. The workforce at Scotston near Glasgow is almost ready to assemble the six sections together. They're missing the bow, the front of Daring, which is manufactured 500 miles away in Portsmouth on the south coast of England. It's June 2005. Perched on top of a barge, the completed 900-ton bow section of Daring begins the long journey to Scotland, where it'll be joined to the rest of the ship's hull. As the bow heads north, the central section continues to grow at the Scotston Yard. Giant steel boxes are hoisted into position and welded together to make up the 13 deck layers. It takes 600 men and women working shifts day and night to keep the construction on schedule. After its five-day passage from Portsmouth, the bow section has arrived on the Clyde. It's lifted onto a slow-moving transporter capable of crawling safely into the yard with its heavyweight load. It's a monster. There's just centimetres to spare either side as the giant structure makes its grand entrance. Ah. 
Some things in shipbuilding never change, generation following generation into the yards. Like his brother, Ross McClure has worked on the Clyde since he was a 16-year-old apprentice. His sons are following in his footsteps. This morning we're going to be putting in the forward and aft propulsion motors. They weigh approximately 99 tonnes, and that will take the cranes to the limit with the biggest lift we've ever done with the four cranes. To lift it off jig so that we don't swing it and hit the gas turbine, a very expensive piece of equipment. If anything goes wrong then, it could be catastrophic. The noise that you can hear is literally the brakes creaking because it's right on its maximum capacity. But hands start to sweat this time. If it doesn't stop, it'll keep rolling. The electric motor is successfully lowered into place. More than 70% of the key equipment in Daring and the other Type 45 destroyers is completely new. The Navy thinks they're as groundbreaking as the evolution from sail to steam. They're also future-proofed, able to take new equipment as it becomes available. The Navy's current destroyers are showing their age, they evolved from the best technology of their time. For hundreds of years, the Royal Navy has sailed the world's oceans, protecting British interests abroad. The Navy was crucial to building the only truly global empire and establishing colonies in all four corners of the world. Until the Second World War, the Royal Navy was the biggest, best equipped and most capable on the high seas. One man with encyclopedic knowledge of all things naval is Professor Eric Grove. Britain first got a modern permanent national maritime fighting force in the middle of the 17th century and within 100, 150 years had grown to be the largest navy and most powerful navy in the world, which was sort of consecrated at Trafalgar and proved in the Napoleonic War. And throughout the 19th century, Britain maintained good order at sea and used the sea to project its power as the world's dominant nation. But then in the Second World War, the United States, which mobilized its resources for the first time, emerged as the major naval power. And so since the end of the Second World War, we've seen our major role as being the most important ally of the United States as a sort of Anglo-American maritime consortium. Naval victories such as Trafalgar may be written into the legend of great sea battles. But more recent history reveals a catalogue of uncertainty in committing to new technology at sea. There have been six other Royal Navy ships named Daring. The first was a 12-gun brig that ran aground off West Africa in 1813. She was scuttled to prevent capture by the French. The second was another 12-gun brig that served in North America and the West Indies for 20 years. The third daring had only four guns, but she was steam and sail powered, constructed of an iron frame covered with teak and copper. She served on the Navy's Pacific and China stations. Daring number no. four was a torpedo boat destroyer built in Chiswick, London. She was briefly hailed as the fastest ship ever with a speed of 28 knots. The fifth ship to bear the name was briefly captained by Lord Louis Mountbatten. Under different command, she was sunk by U-boat U-23 in February 1940 the first Royal Navy destroyer sunk by a German submarine in the Second World War. Almost all of her crew perished. Then came the sixth daring. Her crew is remembered on the Greek island of Kefalonia for their humanitarian work after the earthquake of 1953. The new daring, along with five other Type 45 destroyers, 
is intended to replace an aging fleet of Type 42 ships that were designed before the internet and the mobile phone. Introduced into service during the Cold War, the Type 42 destroyer has been the backbone of the Royal Navy. Several saw action in the Falklands War of 1982 and in both Gulf Wars. One man with experience serving on board these ships is retired Rear Admiral Philip Wilcox. The Type 42 destroyer was very modern in the 70s when it came into service and indeed uh, deployed to the South Atlantic with great effect in 1982, tragically losing two of them, Sheffield and Coventry, one to air attack and bombs Coventry and one to missile attack in Sheffield. <laughs> HMS Sheffield was hit by an Exocet missile. As a direct result of Argentinian air attacks on the task force, the Navy thought again about new threats to its ships from highly accurate supersonic missiles. Lessons learnt from the Falklands became the start point to develop a new anti-air warfare destroyer, the Type 45. What you see in Type 45 is a sort of culminating point of all those lessons being learnt. If we'd had one Type 45 in Admiral Woodward's task group, the situation would have been very, very different. Just nine years later, Type 42 destroyers like HMS Sheffield were very much part of the Royal Navy's contribution to the coalition in the first Gulf War of 1991. In command of HMS Gloucester as a young captain, Philip Wilcox managed to do something that his predecessors in the Falklands War were unable to. There was one big difference. His ship wasn't under sustained aircraft attack. During the first Gulf War, I was in command of a ship very similar to this, HMS Gloucester. And we had been deployed out there for the USS Missouri, a very large battleship, and the minesweeping force. In the early hours of the morning, uh, at around about five o'clock, uh, my optrim team, the picture compilers around the back here, uh, detected a target on our radar coming off the Kuwaiti coast. My anti-air warfare officer, sitting here, made the decision that it was a probable missile. I was up in my cabin at the time and came down. Thirteen seconds, I'm told, to get down to my position here to make the judgment call as to whether or not to fire. At the time, the ship was opening from the coast and therefore the missile was astern. And we had to manoeuvre in order to open the arcs for the Sea Dart launcher to be able to fire over our port quarter uh, and engage the missile. In the nick of time, Philip Wilcox turned his ship and took out the incoming Silkworm missile. The whole engagement was only 90 seconds from detection to destruction. Philip Wilcox Type 42 had a weakness. It could only detect and destroy two missiles simultaneously. The Type 45 is a dramatic leap forward. It's designed to detect hundreds and to destroy up to 36 targets at the same time. Lessons learned from the Falklands and the Gulf War clearly dictated Navy thinking when it came to specifications for their new destroyer. Back in the shipyard, more giant pieces arrive to complete the jigsaw of construction. Daring begins to look like a ship. Each of the six sections is built to millimetre tolerances. The computer design data is accurate. Everything slots together like precision furniture. In 
Inside the newly assembled hull, there's a mass of cabling and pipework. Roughly on the ship, there's 590,000 metres of cables. A ship of this complexity, every piece of equipment has got to be wired up to some sort of computer. It also takes in communications, lighting, heating, and the actual fighting combat systems of the ship. So every cable is unique, and each one goes to a specific item of equipment for termination to allow that piece of equipment to work. January the 31st, 2006, exactly on schedule. Daring is one day from launch. With royalty coming, there's a little touching up to do from someone who's seen it all before. It's actually basically, it's just a cosmetic. It's actually for show, for the launch, so it looks nice and tidy. This will all be burnt off once it's round in the dry dock after it's been launched. The thing is, at the moment, a lot of it's cosmetic, but see when you see it finished, it'll be a totally different thing to see. They're nice when they're finished. They are nice. A lot of, there's a lot of skills going on to, to building these ones now. You know what I mean? New technology and all sorts of stuff. It's, it's amazing what they can do. But as I say, it's the first of its type, and it's the biggest I think they've ever launched in here. So. They've been here before, but even experienced shipbuilders are anxious on the eve of Daring's launch. There's a lot that could go wrong on the day. As we actually slip down the sliding ways, it will clear the door by one metre. Now that is tight. If the tide is that wee bit higher, it will be less. At the width of the door on the starboard side, we have one and a half metres. When we actually slide into the water, we will stop 15 metres from Brayhead, the actual other side of the Clyde. The ship will be stopped from smashing into the opposite bank of the Clyde by hundreds of tonnes of heavy chains attached down each side of the hull. There are more chains on the port side to slew Daring into the channel, facing upstream. It will be the longest, the widest, the tallest and the heaviest actually to be launched from this site. So again, that puts a bit of fear into everybody. Will we be able to stop it in time? Their job done, the workforce head home. With another five ships to come through the yard, their jobs should be secure beyond 2012. February the 1st, 2006. Despite the freezing cold, excited crowds pack the Clyde. Launching a ship is like a street party, an opportunity for local people to celebrate. A tangible sense of pride and community fills the giant shed. It marks the beginning of the Navy's involvement in the completion of their new ship. Look at the children with their balloons. Um, they're almost as excited as I am. Uh, today's a fantastic day. Officiating at the launch, First Sea Lord Admiral West is one of the Navy's most experienced sailors. He was captain of HMS Ardent, sunk on May the 21st, 1982, during the Falklands War with the loss of 22 crew. He upheld the ultimate naval tradition. He was the last to leave his sinking ship. I'm really excited. I'm a bit like a tigger today. It's really fantastic news. I leave the Navy shortly, and what a wonderful thing for this country and for the Navy that we've got these ships coming in. This day is a shipbuilder's day, to be honest with you. This is their milestone. They're doing all the sums to make sure the ship goes into the water safely. But it's phenomenally important that the Royal Navy's here. The Clyde shipbuilding area has got a huge legacy with the Royal Navy. And actually, today is a celebration. Today, we go from being a complicated engineering project to being a warship with a heart and a soul. Daring's sponsor, the Countess of Wessex, is in Glasgow to launch the ship. Oh, 
After the lights of the Countess had pressed the champagne bottle and smashed it against the hull, there was a slight lull of maybe a few seconds. That would be because the ship would be sticking literally to the ways with its own weight embedded on it for the last month. All we do is put the hydraulic jacks on at the front, give it a wee pump, starts it off, and away she goes. Once it starts moving, there's no stopping it. The clearance after actually going out the door would be one metre. I think it was a wee bit tighter than a metre, but it made it. Once it gracefully went into the Clyde, nice and smooth, no rough bumps at all, and then we started to get into the water, we felt the drag chains taking it. stopped exactly 20 metres from the key wall. We anticipated 15, so we stopped that wee bit earlier. <laughs> fantastic, absolutely fantastic. The ceremony over, Daring is immediately moved towards dry dock, where the rest of her sophisticated radar and computer systems will be fitted. There's only 18 months before she's due to sail out of the Clyde under her own power to begin sea trials. Within days, the yard will begin to assemble the next Type 45 destroyer. For Daring, her life is just beginning. HMS Daring is the Royal Navy's latest high-tech warship for the 21st century. Her distinctive profile owes everything to revolutionary new radar.
sitting high above the sea surveying the horizon, this rotating dome houses the latest British-built multifunction radar known as Samson. Head of the Samson team at BAE Systems Insight, Frank Howe. If we look at this radar here, it's a conventional radar because it has a single transmitter and a single receiver. It actually sends out a fan beam out into the sky and then if it hits an object, it's reflected back. The radar then receives that reflection and it produces a radar picture for the operator on board ship. That's its single purpose. With a multifunction radar, it's exactly as it says. It carries out a number of functions. The way it does that is it has thousands of these transmitters and receivers as opposed to the one on a conventional. On a Type 42, you can only engage two targets at any one go. What Samson can do, all simultaneously, is engage multiple targets and still carry on with surveillance. Normally on board ship, this would be 32 metres above the deck and 36 metres above sea level. The reason for that is that Samson has to see the horizon. What that enables us to do is see threats very, very quickly. The other improvement that Samson does is it can also manage any air targets overhead. So it's actually looking at the horizon and it's looking overhead and at the same time rotating. So it throws out a huge protection zone of hundreds of kilometres wide. And that means that it's not just protecting the ship, but it's protecting any asset that's within that dome of protection. The Samson radar weighs five tonnes and rotates 30 times a minute. The ship is long enough and wide enough to provide a stable platform in all weathers. Samson will sit high above the water on a specially designed mast housing all the electronics and power supply. The mast is manufactured in Portsmouth on the south coast of England. It's ready to be shipped to Scotland and fitted onto the deck of Daring. She's over 18 metres tall and she's too big to go into any hold of any ship. So she needs to be transported on the back of a barge. She's in for quite a rough, bumpy ride. And we've had to make sure that she's fully weatherproof and she'll be completely welded to the deck of the barge. So for her to flip over the barge, you'd have to capsize. The thing we're most nervous about is when she actually comes through the door and the wind hits her, because we have 336 millimetres from the top of the crane to the underside of the door, and something that size caught by the wind could literally drag people into the water. I'm just looking forward to waving goodbye to her. She's been... Um, so I've been part and parcel of, of Daring since day one, since the first cutting of steel. Um, and when this piece goes now, from our point of view, that'll be the complete ship. The mast begins the slow and difficult journey north to Scotland, 550 miles in nine days. Because of the schedule, they have to transport the mast in winter. Rougher seas could make the trip interesting. Maximum two meter sea or swell, anything above that, and she'll start slamming. She'd lift up at one end, you know, going up on the swell, and then just dropping down, and it can cause structural damage. These waves are nothing compared to the massive swells that Daring and its high tech equipment will face at sea. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there, safely. The harsh environment has made Samson's manufacturers think carefully about weight and the risk of corrosion damage from salt water. All the way through, we were looking for innovative designs and solutions. And to help us here, we actually went to the racing car industry. And what we did is we used a carbon composite, which they use for racing cars. So this is incredibly light and incredibly strong. If it's in iced conditions, for instance, it won't ice up because the ice just cannot adhere to the outside. 
and it's able to withstand high temperatures without allowing any kind of damage. So the paint itself actually manages all of that for us. In Scotland, work continues in the dry dock. Propeller blades, each weighing almost two tons and cast from corrosion-resistant alloys, are bolted onto the drive shafts. It's these blades that will accelerate daring to over 30 knots and stop her in less than five ship lengths. The mast, safely transported from Portsmouth, slots into the middle of the upper deck. The long-range radar, a support to the multifunction Samson unit, is craned into position. Once operational, it will see out to a range of hundreds of kilometers. The self-loading, computer-controlled 4.5-inch gun sits in the bow section. The five-ton Samson radar is hoisted over the ship to sit on top of the mast, 32 meters above the deck, 36 meters above sea level. As the eyes and ears of the ship, the radar will feed information to the missile control system, the brain. In front of the bridge, 48 missile silos the size of phone boxes are lowered into place. Taking their orders from the Samson radar, the missiles will provide defence from aircraft and missile attack. The system is designed to control several missiles simultaneously. So far, the ship's company consists of one man, Marine Engineer Commander David Schutz. As Daring nears completion, the complement of officers and sailors grows. It's a once-in-a-career opportunity. Every warfare officer who's worth his salt aspires to command his own ship. I mean, everybody wants to be the captain, to be the boss. To get the first of class, to get HMS Daring, is simply the icing on this particular cake for me. To bring a ship out of build is a very special event, but the technical problems associated with a brand new ship are technical problems. They will be resolved, they will be satisfied over time. But to be part of the first crew, to set that ethos and that tone and that, that fighting spirit that will underpin this warship, that comes from the first crew. As of this week, I have 52 sailors now that form HMS Daring Ships Company, all of whom are as excited as I am by the prospect of sailing the first of class. Yeah, you're done. From their first moments on board, the new crew can't fail to notice the differences, particularly below decks. It's hard work to manoeuvre around ships normally, but this ship is a lot easier and a lot kinder environment. And the passageways through the ship are bigger. The ship just has a generally airier feel than, say, for example, a Batch 2 Type 42, of which is very small, very dank. You can't really pass two people in a passageway. It's as if sailors' living conditions have been taken seriously for the first time. Gone are the days of 75-man, 50-man messes. All the junior eights live in six-berth accommodations. This is my bunk space here. Um, we've, got, we've got a board there where I can put all my like, photos or whatever I want up there, posters and that, another one there. We've got a small personal locker for valuables inside. Um, another personal locker there. I've got a big locker to hang all my shirts and trousers up in there with three shelves in. And another drawer there. and. Two boot drawers there for like my, uh, my boots and my shoes and all that sort of stuff. Things must have been pretty bad on previous ships if they think these cabins are spacious. The accommodation is just absolutely fantastic. The, the, the junior sailors, the most junior sailors, are an accommodation which I could have only dreamt at as an officer in most of my time in the Navy. In a Type 42 destroyer, the ratio of junior rates to showers is 50 to 1. On here, it's 12 to 1. I know the old, old generation sort of said, oh, it wasn't like that in my day, you know, it's all gone to dogs. But actually, it's very important. And the quality of them, of the people today, I have to say, is as good as the quality 41 years ago when I joined the Navy. In fact, I have to say, most of the young officers, I think, are far more focused than I was when I was a bit of a shambles in those days. Well, this is obviously my office as well as my cabin. Um, so if you look over here, this is my desk space, um, and this is where I'll have my computer access. All the senior eights live in either two or single berth cabins, and the officers' cabins are, are very big as well. Over here, you'll see there's a little sink. Um, all goes where I keep my uniforms and, and plain clothes. And then just here we have the bed, which um, I haven't tried yet, but... Folds down like so, 
obviously. Um, I've got a bit of work to do tonight because I've got to make it before I can get into it. Tomorrow marks a special day for the new crew of HMS Daring. December 2008. It's time for the Royal Navy to take over their new ship. The build is finished, the crew ready to raise the white ensign in a ceremony that welcomes daring into the fleet. The ship has its first captain. This morning was a great day. It was almost like a wedding where everyone was excited about it. So the company was handing over the ship and they were excited about the end of a build. And the ship's company were really excited about making this ship a home. Hi, the carrier. And I thought the ceremony with the raising of the White Ensign by a warrant officer just about to leave the Navy is almost his final act in the Navy. So that was very poignant. And then the ship's company, looking extremely smart, marched up the gangway onto their new home. I thought the event was, um, was extremely poignant and, uh, and I was really quite proud of, them, uh, of everyone. With Paul Bennett in command, Daring is ready to sail with a Navy crew for the first time. Out of the Clyde, it's full ahead as Daring is taken for a test drive. High on the list of her specifications is rapid acceleration and the ability to take tight bends at full speed. She can break from full speed to zero in less than five ship lengths. Drawing tight figure of eight curves isn't just for show, this agility will be crucial in avoiding air and missile attacks. Daring's principal role as air defender is to protect ships in a task force. She's designed to be flexible and adaptable. There's accommodation for 60 soldiers. The helipad is big enough for all current helicopters. She can sail into shallow waters for humanitarian relief There are two small, fast boats for special forces and rescue work. Warships no longer slug it out at long range with their big guns. As well as missiles and aircraft, the threats they face are getting smaller and cheaper. Navies around the world are learning to deal with terrorists who don't have the benefit of a government-funded war machine. Not all these threats are high-tech. People now talk about hybrid wars, uh, where you have wars being fought at a relatively low level ashore, but quite high-level capabilities might be involved. Look what happened to the Israeli corvette off the Lebanese coast. 
during the Israeli attack on Lebanon. It was hit by a missile coming from the shore. You need a pretty effective air defense system to protect you even from somebody like Hezbollah. In October 2000, the USS Cole was almost sunk by terrorist bombers in a small boat off the coast of Yemen. 17 soldiers were killed as they lined up for lunch. Daring may be packed with new technology, but she's still vulnerable to attack using cheap, conventional weapons. It's down to Captain Bennett to be sure his crew knows how everything on board functions and they can deal with all threats. The contact, where is it? Contact is red 140. Positive report of it turns inbound. Steer 290. Steer 290. Increase in speed. We refer to it as a quick draw exercise, which is testing a ship's reaction to an unknown craft. Uh, we might be on passage somewhere abroad, and suddenly we find there's a potential hostile craft. Turning inbound now, sir, I say suspect. Sir, I'm happy to go quick draw. Yeah, quick draw, yes, please. Aye, sir. So we have a set of procedures which allows us to react very quickly, to warn it not to come close, and if necessary, to man guns and to fire warning shots to try and ensure that the boat turns away. Once you've done all those things, if the boat would still come in, you would end up engaging the craft if you felt it was hostile and you were going to protect your own self-defence. Unknown vessel, unknown vessel, you are continuing to close. If you do not turn away, I may be forced to take action against you in self-defence. Contact now, steady. Possible weapon observed. Captain Navigator, one RPG visual in the boat. A $50 RPG or rocket-propelled grenade could cause serious damage. The advantage is, is that we're slightly higher out of the water than many other freezer destroyers. We're faster and can manoeuvre harder. In normal course, this ship would be probably more robust than many. But generally, that sort of scenario would test any ship. It's now turning in bone. I don't think I could say that Daring is suddenly more uh, capable of withstanding you know, that sort of attack. Um, but I think it's down to the people and the training and making sure we react quickly, which is the, the crux. RPG pointed at the ship. I think with RPG, we've got to warn contact red 9-0. Roger, opposition's guns. Warn, warn, warn. P2, warning shots, one burst, engage. The real challenge is that everyone has to react very quickly because you've got little time to do so. And I think we proved to ourselves just how difficult it was. Okay, sir, RPG fired from the boat and it's hit the bridge. Okay. Take, sir, take, P2, take. Contact. I think the basic reactions are there, but we need to be able to do them faster and uh, more instinctively. So that's what we're practicing. I think we're going to do it again tomorrow just for the, uh, the benefit of practice. That completes the run. Turn around. All positions fast off, that completes that run. Altering 270.
May 2009. HMS Daring slips away from her mooring in Liverpool after an open weekend over the bank holiday. Visitors have been allowed on board to see the Navy's latest ship, all part of a PR exercise to let the public see how the defence budget is spent. Each of the six Type 45 destroyers is projected to cost the taxpayer £1 billion. Got one and a half knots astern. Yes, please. The £6 billion total represents a fraction of the cost of bailing out British banks, but the Navy still thinks it should explain where the money's gone. There's a new commanding officer on board, Captain Paddy McAlpine. With a background as a Navy diver, Captain McAlpine has served in the Gulf twice and was mentioned in dispatches in the first Gulf War. It's a terribly exciting time in my life, a terribly exciting time in the ship's life as well, because we are being promised, you know, capability that is beyond um, sort of expectation and beyond any that we've had in the Navy before. We're being promised that it's world-class, world-beating, and the exciting part over the next couple of years is proving that. Chief, cash off the ramp in through a telephone call, Brett. Blind assessment, next report 154. We're getting trapped by a blind nine kills from the start of fast in 319. So we've won the green one to maintain trapped. We're getting by blind. It takes a team of up to 12 to safely navigate out of the Mersey. The hierarchy starts with the captain. On his right, the executive officer is second in command. Two civilian pilots who know the secrets of tides and currents. The navigating officer. The officer of the watch. The helmsman. Two junior officers keeping lookout either side and able seamen who raise and lower signal flags in a tradition that goes back centuries. Some might think it's over manning from the old days, but the Navy thinks it's safe and it works. McAlpine's mission on board Daring is to prove that the complex multi-million pound systems work and his crew know how to use them. He'll lead his men and women in a week of intensive work at sea as they continue to transform Daring into a fully-fledged warship. Clear of the treacherous Mersey Channel and the sandbanks either side, Daring makes speed to the Navy's training areas off the south coast. The bank holiday's over for the young crew. As Daring heads south, the weather worsens. Board George, it's from the guide. In terms of a new course, 230. The guide proceed at 8 knots, unless it's necessary to maintain station. Also, what's Roger? Navigator Roger. Captain Roger. The young sailor that joins the Navy today is a higher calibre than those that have gone in the past. Uh, I think they're more educated. A great many of them have done higher education. There are a number of able seamen on board the ship with degrees, and they need better management, better leadership, because of the standard that they're coming through. It is a highly complex and technical and advanced warfare and technology that we're actually using, but the calibre of people that are coming through are higher than they have been um, ever in the past. Whatever the weather in the next few days, McAlpine's orders are simple. Both crew and ship must prove they can take on fuel and supplies at sea. Then they'll engage in a realistic war game, all in 24 hours. Replacement course is 230, replacement speed is 12 knots. Replacement course is 230, replacement speed 12 knots. Ship and crew have to demonstrate they've scored highly in a series of tasks before they're both passed as ready for operational duty. They need to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, they need to understand why um, the Royal Navy needs a Type 45 and why um, the UK needs to have a Royal Navy. Uh, and that's some of the things that we talk about with them uh, on you know, a regular basis as well. So they understand what their job is and they understand why it's necessary for us to be out here 
for long hours, long days, six months of trials, and then months and months of sea training to prove ourselves. A legacy of history means Britain is seen as one of the world's peacekeepers, expected to dispatch armed forces to trouble spots. This new generation of ship is designed to be the Royal Navy's first step in plugging a gap in its capability. There's an acronym for everything in the Royal Navy. Replenishing or refueling at sea is known as a RAS. Both cleavers ahead, 7-4. It's a vital part of keeping any warship at the ready at any time. Steer 2-3-3. Three, three. Yeah, three, three, it's a technique that was developed by the Royal Navy in the 1930s and has been copied and adopted by navies around the world. Side light on the work of supply ships for the Navy. A warship has a mid-Atlantic date with a tanker to take on fresh supplies of fuel. It's a tricky business getting the tow hitched and the pipe across, but compared with the old days of coaling, it's a Sunday afternoon picnic. The great thing is to see that the ships meet at the right time in the right place, and see there aren't any U-boats there as well. Fort George from the Daring, by visual means, I am commencing my approach. The idea is simple enough. Pass fuel and stores from one ship to another whilst on the move. Set both levers ahead, one, two, zero. One, two, zero, sir. Both levers set ahead, one, two, zero, sir. Keeping two big ships apart is hazardous, particularly when thousands of litres of fuel are piped across. The Fort George sails on a fixed course at 12 knots. It's up to Captain McAlpine to bring Daring close enough to be able to fire lines across to connect the two ships. The sea is relatively calm, but there's still a dangerous pressure zone of rushing water caused by both hulls that can quickly suck the ships together. I mean, you've got 7,500 tonne and 30,000 tonne sort of, uh, you know, ships at uh, 40 metres at uh, 12 knots uh, in high seas. Yeah, it is dangerous. Um, but you get yourself in, in a position and the, uh, the fluid dynamics and the pressure um, and the suction areas alongside both the ships will actually really hold you in position. If you get far too close, if something does happen, then all you need to do is parallel up and eventually the, the, the weight of the water will push you apart and refueling is dangerous as well. The hose would split. And then, of course, in big seas, you have the danger of having a man overboard. A line is fired from the front of Daring that will carry a telephone cable for the two captains to keep in contact. Radio is easy to intercept. A second line is fired from midships. This will bring the giant fuel hose back to Daring. It's not as slick as a Formula One pit stop, but it's just as effective. With the hose connected, the Fort George begins to pump fuel. It can take two to three hours to fill the tanks. up, the hose is retracted, the lines disconnected, and Captain McAlpine eases daring away into the open sea. OK, thank you very much, everyone. Well done. That's the first for a first, eh? You know, first rise for the first in class. Good stuff. And clubs, excellent. Oh, thank you. Well done. <laughs> Comes from ship. Marvellous. Sits there very nicely as well, doesn't she? Too bad, sir. You have to work too hard. Good stuff. Yeah, we do it. OK. Daring's power comes from a propulsion system that's new to the Navy. Two new large gas turbine engines generate high voltage electricity which is used to drive two electric motors and run everything on board.
The ship is a floating power station and it's all looked after by Marine Engineering Officer Lieutenant Commander Julian Lowe. Like Scotty from Star Trek, he's always trying to get the most from his engines. What we have here is an integrated electric propulsion system. It's a large power station, essentially. We have four prime movers, two gas turbines, this is one forward and one aft. We have two generators, one aft and one forward. Each of the gas turbines is about 21 megawatts. I'll put that in scale for you. Um, if you, it's a total installed power of 46 megawatts, that's the kind of power that would keep the lights on in somewhere like Coventry or Leicester. We can go and have a look in the forward gas turbine room. Would you like to follow me? Electric propulsion systems have been used before in commercial shipping, but it's a first for the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy has always been on the front foot. It's always been introducing new technologies. And this is just another example of where we're leading the world, really. If you think back, ironclads, introduction of steam propulsion at sea, steam reciprocating engines moving onto turbines, use of propellers instead of paddle wheels, the introduction of the marine gas turbine, complex cycle gas turbines such as this with heat exchangers had been trialled in the 50s, unsuccessfully at the time. But the point is that we've always been world leaders, and this is just another example. Deep in the ship's hull, below the waterline, is one of two engine rooms. This far down, doors and hatches are sealed to protect from potential fire and flood damage. Gone are the days of soot-covered stokers shoveling coal. This is the clean environment of modern gas turbines and electric motors but it's still deafening. We're currently in the forward gas turbine room of HMS Daring. Uh, what we have here stood directly in front of me is the WR21 gas turbine, and it's an associated alternator, which is a 21 megawatt machine. And over to the left is the advanced induction motor, which is the main propulsion motor for the port shaft, 20 megawatts. You can see the propeller shaft, a thrust block which allows the torque of the motor to be transmitted to the ship and down here to the left is a shaft brake which allows the shaft to be stopped in an emergency. Many of the boxes you see in here are, are far less characterful than perhaps steam turbines might have been, uh, but far more effective. Julian Lowe commands a team that's responsible for all machinery on board Daring, from engines and air conditioning to fresh water supply and lighting. They keep the ship ready to fight at all times. At their fingertips is a level of computer power that's a radical step forward for the Royal Navy. Both propulsion plants are monitored remotely by computers all over the ship. But old habits die hard in the Navy, and every hour on the hour, a junior engineer goes below to manually check that all is well. Daring is in the exercise area off the south coast of England. The crew is summoned to attend a briefing with the captain present. Thanks very much. Relax, everyone. Good afternoon. Yeah, we'll do that. Thanks. It's the first time they and the ship will be pitched into a realistic war scenario, a severe test of their training and the ship's new equipment. Sirs, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the weekly war brief. The area highlighted on the screen is the Brownian territorial waters and airspace above. NATO forces are allowed inside this area, ginger forces and not. The enemy's most dangerous course of action is a unalerted, coordinated, multi-threat, multi-access attack against NATO ships. I expect the ginger forces to be located in their own territorial waters just inside the exclusion zone. Our surface threat tomorrow is we have one Oliver Hazard Perry, which will be armed with eight harpoon and also has the Sea Sprite Hilo. We have two Talwa armed with SSN 27 Sizzler and a Helix.
Okay, what I'm taking from this, guys, is that the actual hawks are going to come out and try to attack us. So everybody on the upper deck hunting, I do not want to get bounced tomorrow as well. That will never happen on board Daring. Is anybody nervous? First war tomorrow? Nerves mean that you're alive. So love your nerves, take control of them, and enjoy tomorrow as well. Any questions? 190 men and women prepare themselves and their ship for a state of war. They walk away knowing that the main threats will come from fighter aircraft and missiles. Will Daring's new multifunction radar manage to keep up with the number of potential threats they expect will come their way? The ship's galley will be closed and battened down throughout the exercise. After this meal, the crew will have to survive on chocolate bars snatched in the heat of battle. HMS Daring is the Royal Navy's latest destroyer. For the first time, she'll be pitched into a war game. It's a simulated battle, but a severe test of a ship's crew and weapon systems. In Daring's case, it's a first chance to assess the new multifunction radar when the ship is under attack from aircraft and missiles. Daring sails quietly into position. Three other Royal Navy ships are taking part. The frigates HMS Northumberland and HMS Iron Duke and the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, Fort George. Officer Watch, reduce 10 knots. Reduce 10. Set both levers ahead, 6 0. Okay, happy with the rudder down. 6 0. Latest intelligence says there could be aircraft and missile attacks at any time. As the navigating officer steers Daring safely out to sea, word comes through that enemy aircraft carrying missiles are on their way. Hey, will Captain confirm? Captain McAlpine will fight the ship from the bridge. He'll also go below to the operations room the nerve centre where information from radar is monitored and the weapon systems controlled. On a quiet day, it's like a call centre. Today, it's more end of pier arcade, packed with people huddled around dozens of screens, collating and feeding information to warfare officers. Daring's anti-air warfare officer is Lieutenant Commander Angus Essenhigh. This is the combat management system. 
And this is where we see all our radar information, our sonar information, and any other information coming in from external sources via the link system, which is how we uh, interface with other ships. Daring's offensive weapons are the very latest. 48 Aston missiles that take their instructions from a control system that's constantly fed data by the Samson radar high above the sea. As the radar rotates 30 times a minute, the data on the screens is updated constantly. It's then fed to the combat management system. It's all known as Sea Viper. Sea Viper incorporates the Samson radar, and that radar has its own brains, effectively, a system called C2, Command and Control. And Command and Control is autonomously look at the speed and the height and the acceleration and deceleration of the contacts coming towards the ship. Yellow implies that we don't yet have an identity on it. Blue means we've already identified it as a friend, and anything in red would be a hostile, and that enables the warfare officers to make decisions as to whether or not these contacts coming towards us are hostile or friendly or neutral. Once we made that decision, we use the Aster missiles, which are state-of-the-art, and those missiles can go out to in excess of sort of 50 kilometers and shoot down incoming planes and aircraft and missiles. Only one man gives the order to fire, the captain. Just at the crucial moment, the computer-controlled command and combat management system crashes and screens freeze. Suddenly, the ship has no ears and eyes. Everyone on the bridge, binoculars, looking at that green 5-0. We've got incoming missiles and our command system is down. The crew reverts to old technology that would make Nelson proud. Binoculars out of the bridge windows. The computer crash isn't a simulation. It's for real. This is a bit of an eight. We've lost power. The ME's are investigating what's caused that partial loss. So we've got to fight through. We've still got DLH, we've still got 30 mils, so we can keep on fighting. Seven Every master master road. binoculars looking out. Low-flying jets at supersonic speed against a leaden sky are difficult to spot. I don't want to see these missiles before they see us. Come on, hunt the skies. Three minutes, 40 seconds. Okay. Quick work by engineers means power to the combat management system is restored. The computers are rebooted. Everyone's screens burst back into life. Manager, that's the combat system back online. All operators, roll on, log on. Got the uh, system back and we're actually building up the air picture as well, please. Aggressive on identification of all the contacts within visual range. Aye, that will do. Thank you. The Samson radar spots an incoming missile alerting Angus Essenhigh, the anti air warfare officer. Heads up, I believe we're coming under multiple anchor raid from Jaguar's armed Sea Eagle. He seeks permission to launch a missile attack. Yes, space engaged. Birds away on track 71. Tell them we've launched birds. Daring's role is to provide a dome of protection hundreds of kilometers wide for the whole task force. The first attack is successfully dealt with. Okay, right, that raid was taken by the weapon system, so we shot it down. Okay, bridge. Next raid is inbound. Down in the operations room, workstations display the next wave of attacks. Captain McAlpine has come down from the bridge as the war game quickly unfolds. Turn away immediately or you will be engaged. You will be engaged. Turn away immediately. Is he within running that He's not, sir, but we'll be doing it under self-defense. We're coming under multiple access raid from Jaguar's armed sea eagle. Sea eagle missile now in the air. Time on top. Three minutes. So request mission engaged. Yes, base engaged. Alpha whiskey, this is Delta. Birds are firm, birds are away. Sea Eagles to the southwest, string three, out. The pace is relentless. Crew and computers face their first real test under combat conditions. We've launched the birds against the Sea Eagle race to the east. 
Alpha Whiskey, this is Delta. Raven splashed out. Okay, you've had two kill assessments of positive kill. Where's the third one? Area air defense doesn't change just because you've got better computers or better radar. You're still fundamentally using the same tactics and procedures as an older ship might do. All you're doing is doing it at longer range with greater accuracy and with greater fidelity to the information that you're going to be using to fight the battle. More attacks come in. Yeah, go ahead, Yeoman. Captain McAlpine is back on the bridge. The bridge keeps in direct contact with the operations room. They work as a team. Down in the operations room, more red tracks on the screens indicate suspected enemy aircraft. We've now had a report that we've got FBA inbounds. They'll be on top of us in uh, 25 minutes, and they have bombs and rockets. Osmos Blue, FBA now at green at five, uh, eight miles, turning inbound. The threat access for the next raid is green at nine zero. Now at green at uh, one at five, uh, five and a half miles, inbound. Aircraft two five zero, five miles, heading for the Iron Duke. The aircraft approach the task force at speed. They've not yet been identified. Identify them. What are they? Success going over the Iron Duke at the moment. Information the Iron Duke has just sustained damage by bombs. Yeah. No duties have been shifted yet at this point in time, I said. Okay. Oh, Roger, Second aircraft, now. What's, uh, 214, four miles. Uh, red 20, four miles, tracking at west or so. Second aircraft is now 175. Three and a half miles. Second aircraft official, over the top. Green at 802 miles. Aircraft now at 326, 1.2 miles. Green at 150, tracking right to left. The aircraft scream in, hoping to avoid radar detection. It's a stark reminder of the attacks on Navy ships by Argentinian pilots during the Falklands War. Aircraft now on top, Iron Duke. Green 100, back into the overhead. made another tentative step towards becoming a warship. But there's a long way to go before she's fully operational. HMS Daring marks a new era for the Royal Navy, a giant step forward into a digital world for the computer generation. History and tradition stand comfortably alongside the new technology that dominates most people's lives. The loss of so many ships and men in the Falklands War haunts the Royal Navy. At last, it thinks it has the ship that should make sure it never pays such a heavy price again. There's an awful lot to prove. There are some teething problems, but so far she's doing exactly what she says on the tin. What we're going to be able to do will change the way that the Navy mans, operates, deploys and fights. I have absolutely no doubt of that. Whilst some feel spending on defence is wasteful, the Navy thinks its new ships are needed more than ever because our world is changing so quickly. I'm determined that the Navy will turn around and say, wow, what a ship that is. No one can know for certain if these ships are a hangover from dated Cold War thinking or will be more relevant than anyone dare contemplate. <laughs>